So, uh, last year at, uh, at, at Ampere, I gave a talk about a new theory, which uh, myself and Martin van der Mark have been working on for the last 30 years or so. And uh, about five years ago, the first version of an, of, a, of an abstraction from that theory, a linear element of what had been a nonlinear theory, was presented for the first time at a Heinz Physics conference. Um, since then, um, it's been developing in, uh, in terms of the base mathematics in which this thing is described. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But before I start on that, so I'm going to talk about dark energy. Dark energy not as some weakly interacting massive particle, as something which can't be observed, something which can't be seen, but dark energy as an element of this new theory which is absolutely essential to the way that ordinary matter works, as well as everything else. There are two ways to hide dark mass or dark energy. You can either hide it so nobody can detect it, so it cannot possibly be seen, that it's somehow hidden from us in that it's uh, something which is... Uh, which is so much less than a neutrino that it interacts with absolutely nothing at all. And that's pretty much what a lot of people think it must be because nobody knows what has been able to observe this dark matter or this dark energy. But there's another way to hide it. And the other way to hide it is if it is extremely strongly interacting with matter. In that case, this stuff can be hidden in plain sight because it's part of all of us. It's part of the fabric of our own existence. And the reason we don't see it is very simple. We have a solar system here with planets whizzing round and round the sun. Every time they touch any of this stuff, wallop, it gets absorbed into the material systems which pass it. This is the other way to hide dark matter. And then the only way that dark matter or dark energy could manifest is in regions of the galaxy, regions of the universe, regions of the generalized universe, where there is no or very little ordinary matter to absorb it. And that is what I'm going to propose, and that is what follows from not a study of cosmology, but a study, not a study of the very large, but a study precisely of the very, very small, how matter itself works. That's what I'm going to talk about today. Now, this work flows from a collaboration with my best friend and partner and half of my thinking brain, Martin van der Mark. And I'm very sorry to say that Martin can no longer talk to us. Two months ago, he started acting a little bit funny, and he is now incapable of speech, and he will be dead very soon with a very aggressive brain cancer. So this is also dedicated to him. And uh, very sad indeed, but nonetheless, anyway, this is our work. Anything of any consequence in here is at least 50% Martin's. So, um, anyway, so... To cut a long story short, very short indeed, because I'll give the whole talk straight away, of course, what I think that dark energy, dark matter is, is that it is an element, it is a scalar field. The first time this sort of thing was talked about was the cosmological constant, which put some sort of tension into the whole of energy, which Einstein said was his biggest ever mistake. For a while he believed that, and then later he changed his mind and decided that no, this was something that was required. So if you look at the history of Einstein's thinking, it went through an oscillation on this, as it were. So, so, but more recently, scalar fields have been proposed as a possible explanation for this stuff. People have talked about something they call quintessence, which they essentially get from trying to fit what is observed in cosmology. But there's nothing other than the parameter. Quintessence can have both momentum and it can have energy, and that's pretty much all that's in it. It's the simple stuff that has those properties. This is not a simple stuff that has properties that are non-logical. It's something which arises from a, from, a, from, a, from a theory. And theory is the same kind of theory, an old-fashioned kind of theory, and these things do not come along very often, which has the same structure as Maxwell's equations and Dirac equation and the Dirac equation, which, as far as I'm aware, is the last time one of these came along. So this is the development of both Maxwell and Dirac, this theory, which leads to this kind of dark energy. That's, uh, Pretty much the whole talk, but then, okay, so now we'll give the talk. <laughs> These are the people who have been involved, and some of them are in this room at the moment. Those, myself and Martin, are the main, um, um, there's a Dutch word for this, and I've got the Dutch word in my head, but I can't think of the English word. in the main, we are the trekkers, we are the pullers for this, uh, for this theory, the people who drive it. But many others, including Casimir, we, Casimir was involved with calculations of the, uh, of um, what might be confining 
elementary particles, the electron in particular, when he was still alive. My father, Graham Williamson, developed the thing I just talked about, rotation horizon. That was his concept. Ariane, Ariane thought about ways you could put two tori together to form something that was spherical. Innes, who's sitting over here, has been helping me with developing the mathematics of reality. We have been trying to develop an underlying mathematics which precisely parallels how reality works at the base level. And we use that mathematics to build up our physics. That mathematics we do not yet have, but the approximation we think is going in the right direction. The maths is getting more and more refined. So, and other people here, Viv Robinson, Michael, Mike, Michael Berry's been involved, Phil Butler taught us the algebra, uh, Mike um, did a, a master's degree with me on this stuff and uh, made some developments on it. Richard has pointed out some errors in our thinking, as has John Duffield. And I'd like to thank the Quesical Society and the Fanatum Society. These are two groups of people I belong to who also have been furthering this research. So, an overview. I'm going to give an overview of the talk. What, the structure of the talk is this. I'm going to talk about what the Quantum Bicycle Project is, the Quesical Project. And then I'm going to introduce the new theory quite briefly. Um, talk about ha talk about wave functions for the photon, fully relativistic wave functions, four component wave functions for the photon, and for the electron within the new theory. Then I'm going to start talking about nilpotence. I'm going to talk about division and its relationship to things which square to zero, square to nothing at all. So and there are a whole set of these invariants, and in particular, Martin and I have been working on this stuff, and Martin has found a general equation that encompasses all possible four-dimensional nilpotence. I'm going to present that equation as well, briefly. That's not the main thrust of the talk, but partly in his aura, I want to put it up on the board, but also to fit in with some of the things that Peter's been talking about and Peter's been doing as well, because a subset of that is the work that uh, is on quaternions, which are part of all of this. So... And then I'm going to come on to the, the main thrust of the talk, and in fact that's going to be a smallish part of the talk in terms of time, because it's going to take some time to cover those things. And in fact the bit about what dark energy is is relatively easy to explain compared to some of these other things. So it'll come fairly late in the talk, but I'm going to propose that one of the elements of this new theory is dark matter, dark energy. I'll say what I think it is. Then I'm going to set a whole set of experiments there are dozens of these. First of all, to talk about how it would look cosmologically. Secondly, to have a look at measurements of it within the solar system, because there are parts of the solar system where this stuff may already be apparent, particularly in the heating of the solar corona, which is a bit mysterious. This stuff is responsible, in my view, for that heating. So, within the solar system, cosmology, but then how could we isolate this stuff in the laboratory? because we are not going to know how this stuff really works until we can isolate it and look at it properly. Because a theory is just stuff you make up, and I can make up lots of different bits when I get to that bit. It's still a bit floppy at the, that, that, that area, not within elementary particles, but when stuff's acting freely, I don't even know if it does exist freely. And the only way to really show that for sure is to isolate it. So I'll propose experiments where you can actually isolate this stuff. And then I'll conclude. That's the structure of the talk. So, I was racking my brain and talking to people, trying to get an English word for this one as well, stelling it. So what, what this is, is, this is not what the talk's about. This is a position that one takes. Stelling it literally in Dutch, it means setting out one's stall, stel. So it's like what you put on the table as to what your general view of things are. There isn't really an English word for this. There should be. So translation from the Dutch just wouldn't work. But here they are. So these are thoughts that I want you to have in your mind as we're going through the talk. First of all, there are a lot of theories around at the moment, and Lou and I were talking about some of these the other day as well, where this theory starts from a position that's already very complex. String theories are an example of that. They start from some sort of vibrating quantum string, which doesn't have a theory describing it. It's just there. You begin with that and then with an awful lot of extra stuff on top. Quantum chromodynamics is another. You start with quite a complicated group structure before you even begin. This one's not going to... And I think that what this does for thinking is it traps you. You can be very clever and do some really stupidly wonderful mathematics, but if you're, but if you're in any system, you're stuck inside that system. You can't get out of the box of being, having to think in that way if you put yourself into that box. So 
magnificent minds lost in the complexity of, complexity of their own imaginings, lots of them. And I want to try and clear that snowstorm of intricate, impenetrable, incalculable theories and come up with a theory which is at base ridiculous and simple, but then where the intricacies very rapidly, the complexity arises. So complexity from sim simplicity, not complexity a priori. Again, this point, everything is nothing and nothing is everything. This is the point that has been beautifully presented by Mark here, and this is absolutely critical to the nature of the universe. The universe is just a, around us is just a more probable form of nothing at all. Mass is balanced by positive, gravitation, negative energy, very close to zero total energy altogether. Second, another one, quantum mechanics is actually a consequence of relativity, not something which is in conflict with it. First, quantum mechanics was originally derived from relativity by Louis de Broglie, just read his thesis. So anybody who thinks there's some sort of contradiction there is just not understanding what's happening with quantum mechanics properly in the first place. There's a lot of, there are a lot of papers on this. It's easy to get published in that area, but it's all, well, I was going to use a bad word, nonsense. <laughs> Magnetic right, electric left. This is one of the consequences of the algebra of reality. The magnetic field is intrinsically left-handed. Nature is intrinsically handed. Sorry, magnetic right, electric's left-handed. <laughs> so easy to get lost in your own complexity of your own imaginings, I don't know. Now, the next thing is, I'm talking about something which is very, very strongly interacting. Pivot is the strongest interaction. The interaction which, that interaction is what's responsible for the electron confining itself. Now, the electron is a very, very light particle. The force required to make the internals of a light speed electron, like a Dirac electron, go round and round in circles is a Newton, pretty close. Something is holding the charge of the electron together. Electrons don't explode. Look around you. But a charge distribution should explode if there was no force holding it together. That force is not actually a real force. That force is a, a zero force. Everything is nothing. It's a, it's a balance. The, the way this thing moves is something which moves naturally along the geodesic. I'll show you how that works briefly. It's stronger than the strong force. How do you know? Go to CERN, start bashing the rocks together. Take an electron, get it up to something which is about a thousand times the proton's mass energy, hit it into a proton, smash! The electron comes out totally unscathed, and this proton is so far in bits that it's become other particles. We'll eventually get a proton at the end of it. So if you think that's the strong force, what's holding the electron together? Something stronger. So. So, and in fact the strong force is the same force in the proton, it's again this pivot force. So it's an origin for the strong force. And I want to talk about the hierarchy of forces. Now Martin gave a talk on this in San Diego a couple of years ago, it's out, um, people can look at that. Uh, this is a, an idea that he and I had for a long time. The hierarchy of forces, there are a set of forces. The forces you see are not the strong ones. The forces you see are the weakest ones. The weakest force in the room is what's holding me on the floor, gravity. Everything else is not apparent. Why not? Because the electric force, which is the next weakest one, has completely and utterly satisfied itself. Every single electron is wrapped up with a proton, net charge zero, no external force. Because that's what they do. It's strong, it takes everything. And it leaves gravity to mediate. The next one down is magnetism. Why don't you see, why doesn't the electron have a magnetic moment? Well, it does in a magnetic field, but it has zero moment and zero electric in magnetic field. It's because the magnetic force 40, is 40 times stronger than the electric. It's satisfied itself, it's completely neutral magnetically, but it has an electric charge, which is what comes out externally. And this goes on with all of those forces, with the, with the, with the forces that have to do with time. Peter, beautifully, has said that there are three of these things in a triplet, strong, weak, electromagnetic. But there are four, gravitation. Yeah. It's quaternion plus the real time. I think it's time, space, space. I think it's time, one space, two space, three space. So 
So, so it's the quaternion part yes, and then the extra one. That's right. It's the yeah. quaternion yes. part. Yes. And the extra, the more and more confinement, more and the more last more. part. Of the yes, the one that's missing, which is time. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. So, what are we talking about here? I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about dark energy. I'm going to talk about dark root energy. And what do I mean by root energy? I mean something which you have to square to get the energy density. Now, this is utterly, the square root stuff is utterly fundamental. The stuff we talk about are square root energy densities. The energy density in the electric field is a half dE. And this half comes about from calculus, of course, because you know that the reason it's half is because you want to derive it from a vector potential. So the differential of the vector potential gives you the field, and that gives you the half bit. And the DE, well, another way of writing this is writing that it's a half epsilon E squared. So the electric field is a square root energy density. Thank you. That's pretty effective. Good <laughs> <laughs> window. It's a square root energy density. Same in quantum mechanics. The wave function energy density is psi star psi. It's a square. It's the square root energy which is fundamental, not the energy. Well, energy is absolutely conserved. So, also, one talks about the fabric of space-time, as though this is something which you can go off and sort of stitch together and do a bit of knitting with. But the fabric of space-time is whatever it is. If you're living in space-time, you can't say what that fabric is, because it is itself a part of you. You're sitting in that kind of situation that Wittgenstein describes, where you can't look outside of the box in which you're trapped, because we are parts of space-time ourselves. So... But this reality of the space-time around us is filled with local mass energy in various seemingly complex forms, electrons, protons, photons, neutrons, all sorts of stuff. How does that complexity arise if we're going to take a, a, a theory which is at base as simple as possible? And that's the mathematics of reality I want to talk about. So, what I'm going to think about is I'm going to talk, think about this root mass energy that can transform from one form to another, that can play in space and time, which is made of what? Where is that energy going? It's going into space and time only. I'm going to introduce five parameters. Let me guess why five. Well, it's always five, right? <laughs> five parameters. Time, three dimensions of space, and root energy and nothing else. That's it. No quarks, no leptons, no charge, no shit. Just space, time, and root energy. And then try and derive everything from that. That's the bicycle project. It's the quantum bicycle project which more and more people are joining in with. So to do this kind of trick, one needs some astonishingly potent mathematics. Now there is only one such mathematics. We don't, I don't, we don't know what that mathematics is yet. It's the solution of Hilbert's sixth problem. Hilbert's sixth problem is finding that mathematics which precisely reproduces the whole of physics just and no more. Now, there is only one proof. Imagine there are two, two such mathematics. One of these mathematics, by definition, can be put into one to one correspondence with everything that happens in nature. So can the other. Therefore, the second one is the same as the first, and there is only one. So there is, a, there is at most, only one such mathematics. And it is our task, and Innes is helping with this, to try and find what that mathematics is. The current version, which, I'm, which has just been published, June of, just become public June of this year, June of 2019, is, differs slightly from another in that the implicit ordering of space and time we have reversed. We take time before time within space rather than space within time. So time is innermost, then space, and then energy comes into that. So the inner, innermost thing is now time. That changed in 2015. So the talk, 2015, that's right. Or we, I changed that in 2015. Now, so the result of all of this is that we're going to end up with a set of terms which describe things which are physical, not imaginary. 
and I mean not imaginary in the complex sense here. Um, the elements which I'm going to describe correspond to things which, with which you are quite familiar. There's going to be stuff which corresponds to current, for current. There's going to be stuff that corresponds to the electromagnetic field, six components. There's stuff that corresponds to intrinsic angular momentum, four components. And there's going to be stuff that corresponds to dark energy, dark mass, two components. So that's it. But what these things are is they are built of space-time. So the current is a flow in space-time, x, y, z, t. And the t flow is charge. x, y, z is the current. Current in x, current in y, current in z. The six aerial forms, which consist of something which is... Uh, x times y, y times z, z times x. They're the three components of the magnetic field. Space times time, x times time, y times time, z times time, are going to turn out to be the electric field. Now, am I just making this shit up? No. I'm not just making it up, am I? But I'm not just making it up. <laughs> Why not? Because when you do the mathematics of this, the mathematics of those components turn out to be exactly all four Maxwell's equations. So if you want energy in that, then it's got to be that stuff. That is what field has to be, if that's what you take, if you take space-time as a starting point. So that's why this field is what it is. The current is the vector part. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Current is a flow in space. Yeah, hey, fantastic. So a four flow. So get, these things fit perfectly. Angular momentum is some momentum which is also rotating about something. Now, well, momentum rotating about something is what I call an angular momentum. I don't know what you guys call an angular momentum, but if it, that's the form of the thing, that's what it is. So, that's what, so these things are not going to be in spinner space, they're not going to be in SU3, they're not going to be in quarks, and let, they're going to be current, field, angular momentum, and that's pretty much all of it, only. So, Nonlinear effects appear in higher products of the thing. I'm going to start with the linear theory. Now, most theories are not linear. Nina talked today about Schrodinger equation, for example, which has elements which are quadratic and elements which are linear. So most of the theories, wave equations, quadratic. There are very few that are at the linear level, pretty much Maxwell and Dirac, relativistic quantum mechanics. That's about it at the moment in terms of things you can calculate with. Now, nature can't choose its maths. There is only one. It's complicated, but it's actually really simple at root because, as I said, it's only going to be space, time, and root energy. And this algebra is set up to parallel the physical process of the way that space and time work. Relativistic nature. The multiplication in this thing is going to yield energy momentum. So, for example, field times field gives energy, energy momentum density. So, um, the cross part of that is going to yield, a, that's a bivector in the, in the terminology of a multidimensional hyper-complex algebra. The bivector part of this is going to yield areas from lines. So if you have something which is a flow, and that flow is moving sideways, you're going to generate. So if you have a vector potential A, dA perpendicular is going to give you a field, just like in all your favorite textbooks on, well, that is electromagnetism. This is the basis of electromagnetism, dA is F. Then you build up the fields from that. Okay, it's a four differential for four vector, so it's complex in that way, but really we're just talking about how stuff changes. Lines change to planes. Planes fold out to volumes. Volumes fold down to fields. Angular momentum transforming to fields. Angular momentum being the source of the electric field, for example. These things are things that really happen under differential processes. So, Although multiplication can give you an area, division can also give you an area. If you... <laughs> Taking much longer than I should. I must go much faster. Right. So, um, so we're going to talk about an algebra. That algebra has multiplication, division, uh, subtraction, and addition, as usual. But, because the algebra is being made more like reality, Certain things can't happen in the algebra of reality. For example, subtraction can't happen. You can't have one minus one. You can't have field up minus field down is nothing, because that wouldn't conserve energy. Field has energy, so field up plus field down cannot be zero. Might 
field minus field can't be zero. So certain processes that we learned in primary school just aren't in the mathematics. Mathematics is being limited and limited and limited again to make it correspond with what actually happens in reality. So also division, division, division. You look, divide six by three or six by two, you get three. You get two and three, right? You can divide a certain number of things in a certain set of groups. But what does it mean to divide space by time? What does it mean to divide a space by a time? What the hell are you talking about? Dividing a ruler by a clock. What is that? What do you mean by division? I mean, okay, you put one on the top and then draw a line, put the other on the bottom, but what's the physicality of that? Okay, everybody knows it's speed. It's what someone's speed on it, at meters per second. But speed is not what you think it is. Velocity is not a vector and never has been. How do you know? Because it doesn't follow the rules of vectors. You can't vector out velocity. Something traveling at 0.9c, and 0.9c does not give you 1.8c. It gives you 0.98c. Comes up to, it never reaches c. So this thing is not a vector, it's a bivector because it has space divided by time. Space and time, it's a space-time bivector. So things are not as you, not as you used, them to, used to them be. Don't worry, if I start running out of time, I'll just jump to the bit about dark energy. Right, so the new theory, the way that it works, there's a reference. You can download it now if you want, if you've got access to the internet, it's open. But in the simplest form, it can be written as d mu psi g is equal to zero. Where d mu is a four derivative, it's a Dirac Clifford derivative, a four vector derivative. So this is d by dt, d by dx, d by dy, d by dz. That's a sine, plus d by dx, minus d by dy, etc. And psi g is a 16 component wave function. But those 16 components are simple in the sense that they're all derived from space and time. So what are the 16 components? Four of them are space, 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 and time. Six of them are space, 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 and space, time, space, time, space, time. Tx, Ty, Tz, three components. X, Y, Y, Z, Zx, three components. Six components, that's the field. So anything which is an area is a field. Anything which is a line is a vector, is a, is a, is a, is a current. So if it's got one index, except for this one, if it's got one index, it's a vector. If it's got two indices, it's a bivector, an area. Three indices, it's a volume. So the simplest volume is the hedgehog, which is a directed volume element, x, y, z, which can either be outward directed, the hedgehog, or inward directed, a very uncomfortable anti-hedgehog. Right. So, so you have this outward or inward directed volume. There's also hypervolume, which is called the inventor of the word is sitting in the room, the quedgehog. <laughs> the quantum hedgehog, or the, or the quadri hedgehog, the four-dimensional hedgehog, is a directed four-volume element. So, um, and that's this one, um, down here, four indices, four-volume. The three-volume, the hedgehog, is three indices, where's that? But, the, but, which one have missed? oh, there it is, that's the hedgehog. So it's, it's, it's represented by a unit element with uh, three indices. Squares to um, plus one. So you've got root energy in 16 space times four time form. Vectors, fields, angular momentum, and two scalars. And these are Lorentz scalars. The mathematics is built in such a way that the scalars are invariant under a Lorentz transformation. The vector and the trivector vary as vectors, as, as four vectors under a Lorentz transformation. And the six ve and the divectors vary as fields, as they should. This is not put in to make it work like that. It just does work like that because of the way that the algebra is defined in the first place, being a relativistic algebra. Now, the subset of this, what, what's the utility of this? Well, the subset, if you just take this term and do d4 of the field, you get exactly all four, all four Maxwell's equations. You do not get all four Maxwell's equations in your favorite textbook. You get two of them. And then somebody goes, hey, 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 hey. wrong sign. Uh, we'll use the dual field for the other two. So you actually have two sets of equations. Or, if you're a bit more advanced, say, yes, I think we should introduce the anti-symmetric um, Christoffel symbol to this stuff. And then we'll get the other half. So either way, it's bullshit. What you should do is use the right algebra from the in the first place. The algebra of reality. So, okay. Relation with other theories we'll skip, uh, except to say that uh, it contains Maxwell, it fixes some of the problems in relativistic quantum mechanics and extends it, 
and it provides the base starting point for quantum electronics. Apart from that, there's no relation with other theories. Here is the full, in all its glory, sorry, it's all the maths. Here's the full set of things. If you do it term by term and just multiply that d mu psi g out, you get that. But you'll see if you sit down and study the terms that actually they just drop <laughs> this form in conventional. B is the electric field, E is the, B is the magnetic field, E is the electric field. P and Q are these dark energy terms. And this is the vector potential, and this is the spin. T is the spin term. So you have four equations here, are just the Maxwell's equations with new mass terms in them, with two new mass terms. That's the stuff we're going to look at here. But there are also four other equations which couple current to spin in the same way that fields are coupled amongst each other in the Maxwell's equations. But these equations are new. They are extra. They're extra constraints on what is allowed to happen. So they're spin current equations. And they haven't been studied at all yet by anybody. So that's them being put up on the board there for so these are the different components. I've talked about this. You have uh, time, space, magnetic field, electric field, angular momentum, quedge hog, and, the, um, and this special scalar term I call the pivot. And the reason it's the pivot is because it's pivotal. Because it is that thing that takes light, if you have electron-positron creation, takes light and turns it around so that it turns into a vortex of light, which is what I think the electron is. And it is, so what the pivot does for you is it changes the direction of the pointing vector. It changes the direction of the momentum flow from something which goes straight on to something that goes round and round in circles. It's not a force because the zero force condition is the differential of this is zero. The differential of the full momentum is zero. It's a, well, it's a force of nature in that sense. I'm not going to talk about this, although, um, I'm not. I'll just, yeah, Mark was talking about the Z shift. This thing here, R, is the same thing. R is his Z. It's the, it's, the, it's the red shift. If you take, people think that Lorentz transformation goes with this gamma factor. That's not the deepest way of understanding relativity. The deepest way of understanding relativity is in terms of the red shift. And in fact, the gamma, the gamma factor is exactly mathematically, if you have light in a box, green light in a box, you move the box, what happens is in one direction of, in the direction of reflection of the light, in one direction the light blue shifts, and the other e direction it red shifts. Now if you start with one plus one, one amount of energy going left, one amount of energy going right, as those two things transform, one goes as one over r, down to zero, the other goes as r, up to infinity. And it's the difference between those which is responsible for gamma. It is gamma. Gamma is just a half of r plus one over r. It's the same mathematics expressed more simply than this one over square root of one minus v, one plus v squared over c squared. That's relativity. That's where it comes from. It doesn't. This is why you can't go faster than light because everything's partly made of light. It's nothing to do with the fact that it's some stupid rule invented by a bureaucrat. Although nearly everything is. <laughs> Okay, this thing has um, solutions, but the solutions look different in the new theory because in the new theory phase factors, which you're used to having as being something like omega kx minus omega t, a scalar phase factor, in this theory, those things are hypercomplex in the sense that space and time have the, the rule of absolute relativity is of this new theory is that no quantity may appear without its proper space-time form. Time has to have unit of time, and it has to have the property of being in the time direction. That's what this thing is, alpha zero. Space Z, the third direction of space, has to be have the properties of being have associated with a unit vector in the space direction, even in an exponent. And what that does for you is it means that your wave functions become not two component, but four component wave functions. And the result is that you end up with a solution. But the nature of that solution looks different in space and time. In space, you have a solution which is exactly the photon, which is exactly the solutions for Maxwell's equations, because this is Maxwell's equations, this is a solution to Maxwell's equations, this twist through space and time. But in space, you have something which is literally a spiral. In time, what you have is you have something which is a rotation. 
So if you, if you fix space and look at time, you see rotating stuff coming in with a circularly polarized photon. If you look along the wave front, you see an actual rotation, a twist. They're different because they have different natures. But this wave function, that wave function in the paper, is relativistic. It transforms exactly, properly, relativistically, from green through to infinite energy, down to zero, oblivion at redshift. It's the first proper photon wave function. Why is that working? Because the math is it right. Same thing for if you take the Maxwell's equations, here are the Maxwell's equations, but just with this extra term P, P is the pivot, P is dark energy, P is this new term, P is a scalar field which contains mass, constitutes mass energy. If you just put that term in, something happens which is the, to the, to the uh, pointing vector. So the normal thing, if you want to get the momentum, energy momentum flow of the electromagnetic field, is you do um, F, F dagger, field times field going this way, times field going the opposite way. So you're putting field in a box. Put field in a box, you can weigh it and get its mass energy. And if you calculate it, you end up with E squared plus B squared. Okay, there, there's, there's an absolute zero in there as well if you want SI units. Electric field plus magnetic field. And you get E cross B, which is the point effect for the momentum density. Put P in, you get a term which is perpendicular to the pointing vector in the momentum. So what light does, it goes straight and straight, 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 unless there's some dark energy there. If there's dark energy there, it goes straight and perpendicular. It goes round and round in circles. And round and round in circles is confined. It's a particle. It's energy which is not going anywhere. Well, it's going round and round in circles. But apart from that, it's not getting anywhere. So it's not a force stopping something. It's like a dance. The dance of light within an electron. The dance of the electromagnetic field of the electron, which is responsible for the electron charge, which you can calculate, Williamson and Van der Mark, 1997, which is precisely, pretty much, okay, it's within 3%, the elementary charge that, um, that, uh, that we know and love, 1.6 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Anyway, the... We don't really calculate the electron charge that precisely. We put limits on it. The limit is anything from 0.97 times the electron charge to about 20 or 30 times the electron charge fits within the realms of the different configurations you can have for light within the theory. It happens to be quite close to the lower end of the limit, but at least it's within the right ballpark, which it isn't in quantum electrodynamics, for example. It's infinite in quantum electrodynamics, negative infinite in quantum electrodynamics. But we can calculate it from the spin. They're related. Through those equations, also spin current equations. So if you do that, what you do is you suddenly have new solutions. The new solutions look like this. And this is, in fact, a slide of the whole of last year's talk. So you can have, this is the process of electron-positron pair creation, matter going to light, or, alternatively, photoproduction of pairs. We saw them today, lots of us, in the cloud chamber. That's where this is coming from. Those showers we see start with a high-energy electron, which then forms electron-positron pair, which goes to photons, which ionize to produce electron-positron pairs, which produce a whole set of high-energy electrons and positrons, which you can measure in a cloud chamber. But that process is a completely natural process of very high energy. It happens all the time at CERN, and all the time on planet Earth, as you've seen, all of you who went to look at the cloud chamber. So that process is where light gets wrapped up into electron-positron pairs, and the electron-positron pairs bang out into give photons and light, backwards and forwards, an electromagnetic shower. Creation and destruction of energy into matter, into energy, into matter, backwards and forwards. How does that work? How does light form particles when it forms it through this extra term, this pivot term? That's where it comes from. So here's Maxwell's equations. This is the extended equations I just showed you. Spin is, here's an expression of what they are, and it extends the electromagnetism to relativistic and through relativistic quantum mechanics. It's the same operators in relativistic quantum mechanics, but with a different basis. Not a spinner basis, just current, field, and angular momentum. So, and there are five elements to all of this, space, time, and root energy only. Pivot, this mass, both confines in the sense that it's responsible for trapping the field, but the field is responsible for equally for trapping the pivot. The reason they can both trap each other is they're 180 degrees out of phase. 
You're talking about something changing to changing to minus to changing to back. It's a four-step process. One, two, three, four. And in the intermediate process, it's going in the opposite direction. So the poet says, right, I'll go and find it's, it's just like Scottish Cayley dancing. You just grab onto your partner and you spin. You're confining each other. You're completely 180 degrees out of phase. Works perfectly every time. Well, <laughs> nearly never, but never mind. Apart <laughs> from that, in the kick. Right, but that's how it works. It's just a dance. It's not a force. It's a force free motion. Everything's force free motion. There is only force free motion. Depends which thing you want to consider a force and what you want to consider a motion. Now, okay, right, good. That's not that more time. How much time have I left? Oh, the whole quarter of an hour. Wow, the luxury. So this is what we call the quantum bicycle motion. Now, what is the quantum bicycle? Why quantum bicycle? Because we are trying to, Martin and I were trying to imagine things in four-dimensional motion. And obviously what we do as humans is try and make an analogy. What an electron is, an electron is kind of, imagine an electron in space. It's just out there in space. There's nothing else nearby. There's some sort of oscillation, quantum oscillation going on. It's really some sort of rotation, but it isn't just one rotation that's happening. Because the thing that created it was a photon with spin one. It was something that was already spinning around an axis, so it had rotation like this. But now, what we said is, okay, we've got the pivot, so it's going to rotate like this. And that, that rotation has to be commensurate in such a way that the field is always in the same direction. And the way that works, if you just do it, the photon is a belt. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a one wavelength rotational twist into that belt by turning it 180, 360 degrees, right? Then I'm going to force it into periodic boundary conditions, like that. The twist is still in the belt. If you look at what it does, it forms a double loop, not a single loop. Why a single, why a double loop? Because the twist is still in there. Look, there's the twist. If I don't put the twist in, let's try not putting twist in. This is what I usually do in the morning. Right? <laughs> Sometimes make a mistake, but nonetheless, you get a single loop, right? Put a twist in, you get a double loop. That double loop has the property that although it's twisting and it's twisting, that the twist, here's the, here's the turn, here's the, look, if I look at the outside of the belt, it's everywhere outward directed. This thing has an electric field which though twisting locally is radially outward directed. It's charged. You've just charged a photon, you've just produced a charge from an uncharged object. Okay, you have another one, the positron, so you still conserve charge, and you must. You also conserve angular momentum. You have to conserve twist. You have to have twist and anti-twist. These things only get created in pairs. It doesn't just come out of nowhere. But that thing also has spin a half. Why does it have spin a half? Because it's half as big as that. <laughs> and that's why it's a half, not a third or a tenth or a hit. Well, you see, that's the other half. So when you get into... into, into Contract dynamics, you get a quarter, of course, you have both the calculus and the. Anyway, then, no, no, that's way beyond this talk. So, the electron is a self localized photon like state. It's not localized light alone because it also contains this dark matter, but it is partly, actually, it's a half localized light. So, looking at all of you here, what I see is I see a half light and a half darkness. <laughs> So, exactly 50-50. So, the inner di so what, 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 what am I talking about here? I've talked about a rotation, and that rotation rotates. But that's not a minimum energy state. Why not? Because if you look at this state, I've told you that the electric field is twisting. Now remember, I've told you about this hierarchy of forces. You have strong, then you have weak, which is strong. We call it weak, logical. Then you have electromagnetic, which is weaker than weak, usually, at least at normal length scales, although it does run with energy like the Higgs boson apparently does. Um, then you have electromagnetic, but the magnetic is stronger than the electric. So, but if I look at this diagram, okay, I've got things charged, charge is sticking outwards, but look, the magnetic field is always in the same direction. It's always in the same direction here. This is the electric field, the green bit. The magnetic field is are the blue arrows, and they're all pointing towards me. That's an axial magnetic field. That's a huge amount of energy. But I can get rid of it very simply if I'm an electron by saying, oh, I can do this dance in three dimensions because I've got three dimensions. So what it does is it rotates so that 
this got like magnetic field up. That's got magnetic field up, but it's going around and around this. It's not all at the same place, it's going around and around. This is a hello, I'm an electron. Right? So what happens is, if that rotates at the same rate, half the rate in fact, then by the time, then this stuff is go was going up, by the time this gets around here, that's going down, it cancels. Again, because the 180 degrees out of phase. And by tumbling head over heels, so you've got a rotation within a rotation, within a rotation, wheels within wheels. Three wheels, three dimensions, cancellation of the magnetic field. And then you end up with this distribution, which is perfectly spherically symmetric if it's what the electron looks like to us. And that's an electron in the new theory. But it's a half dark matter. How do I know it's half a dark matter? Half dark matter because, going back to the previous slide, the photon wave function is a bit that's field. This is, doesn't look like it, perhaps for most of you, but that's just field, that bit there. This R is the Z, is the red shift, blue shift. But this bit here is a four component wave function. That's an electron wave function. And the big trick of electrons is they can emit photons. It's called quantum electrodynamics. Photons are emitted by electrons. They have a probability of, of being emitted and absorbed at roughly the final structure constant, 1 over 137. But how do they do that? They do that by transforming from a mass field wave function with four components. But it turns out, magically, if you multiply that by, not an arbitrary, by a particular electromagnetic field, and that particular electromagnetic field is something that has E perpendicular to B with the same magnitude, that simple multiplication cancels the mass terms to zero. You end up with a massless system, which is precisely the photon wave function. But that fo but this wave function that it comes from, the electron wave function, has four components. Those four components are pivot, one quarter. Quedge hog, one quarter. Both transformers rest masses. Half of every electron in your body is rest mass. But then, electric field and magnetic field, like a photon. Four components. One quarter electric, one quarter magnetic, one quarter quedge hog, one quarter pivot. Every electron. Protons are slightly more complicated, but it's roughly the same for hadrons as well. So that's, that's, that's where that is. So, um, this is the bit I wanted to put in for Martin and Peter. Sorry, there's a lot of maths on that page. <laughs> Right, okay. <laughs> I'm not sure it makes much difference. But the main thing is here, how does an interaction take place? Well, it takes place through nilpotence, through things that square to zero. So, and the reason that happens is most easily seen in the vector. So here's... So what this is, is this is the van der Mark equation, is that is a general inverse for every single 16 component object that can exist. And that inverse goes through a fourth power in the denominator. But let's take something more simple that people will be, if you have a vector, any, any four vector, here's a four vector, so it's got a component in the time, x, y, z component, so these v's are scalars, and these are unit vectors in the x, y, z, t direction. The inverse of that, 1 over v, can be written as v over v squared. But v squared for a vector is 0 for light, because it's on the light cone. So it's ct squared minus x squared minus y squared minus z squared is 0. So if I was to try and do something like d by d tau, instead of doing a derivative with respect to time, I did one with respect to interval, something horrible would happen it would totally mess up mathematically, which is just what you want. You want it to mess up completely mathematically. You're dividing by zero. You're doing d by dt, d tau, and you're trying to make tau go to zero. But tau is already zero. It's already been zero a long time because it's already ct squared minus x squared minus y squared minus z squared, which means that your differential, which is describing some sort of dynamical process, has an infinity, which is why it is possible for you to see a galaxy 3,000 light years away with the naked eye. You look at it, somehow the light has gone from there to you with some probability there's an absolutely nothing. You know what the cross section of 10 to the minus 10 meter squared is at 3,000 light years? Work it out. 
you're going to get numbers worse than 10 to the minus 18, right? That, that's no chance at all. Yet it happens all the time. Just go out on a starry night and look. The reason it happens is because there's this spike in the probability caused by zeros, by nilpotent systems. And these are the general ones. Now, this is the one for, you, you're familiar with this one. It's just um, V0 squared. That's just CT squared minus X squared minus Y squared minus Z squared for that inverse. That's just the light code. That's a similar one for the momentum. This is the one for field. So this is pivot, dark energy, dark matter, plus field. That thing has a zero that looks like this. It's actually some squared term squared. And that's zero for the light cone as well. For, uh, for, for L being zero, well, you can also find other zeros as well, which is interesting. But these are, this is not a division algebra. People think that division algebras are dangerous, nasty, horrible things. What's a division algebra? A division algebra is one where every element in the algebra has an inverse apart from zero. Zero is undefined, one over zero is undefined, but everything else has got an inverse. Any relativistic algebra is not a division algebra. Why? Because there are areas other than zero where division is not defined, namely on the light cone. Otherwise, it wouldn't be relativistic. And yet, people insist on doing E8. And what's E8? E8 is that collection of all algebras which are division algebras. Already lost, already forget about it, don't even go there. But many have, and that's why they call it the desert, because they've all gone in and nobody's come out. Right. Because it just doesn't work. You're not relativistic. Forget about it, you've already got it wrong. So, there's also a spin, I promise this, who did I promise this to? Spin, pivot, hedgehog invariant. This is, this, this, is, this is spin, pivot, spin, uh, yeah, <laughs> pivot, spin, quote shot, we call that P, shouldn't we? Anyway, but nonetheless, its inverse is S minus T minus Q, the fact that it's got plus and minus bits, and it's S zero squared minus T zero squared plus T squared plus uh, Q zero squared. So this thing can also go to zero, it's also got a, uh, a little bit of Anyway, right, that was that aside. But how does this process work? If you've got a process of field emission and absorption, Feynman and Wheeler published a paper a long time ago about the interaction of the absorber as a mechanism for absorption. But in order to get something which actually transfers from A to B, and Peter talked about this as well, and one of the many reasons I consider him one of the most brilliant people I've ever met, is that he also just said, oh, of course, the thing's got to be, if, it, if you have a, spher a, a spherical distribution, you've got to have that, you've got a spherical distribution on both sides. Absolutely correct, but not quite. If you do an inversion of a spherical, this is a slice through a sphere, circle, so you have circles here, a bunch of circles, going out in inverse square away. If you do the inverse of that, you invert it in a, in a unit um, wavelength, so you draw a unit circle here, make it as big as you like, that's just the energy, the smaller the, smaller the circle is, the bigger the energy, then that's what its inversion looks like. It looks like bicircles. And those bicircles are not centered, but they are a feature. So that thing, if you just rotate it, it's a torus. So the thing that can invert a spherical distribution is a torus, or a, or a bispherical distribution. So that times that is exactly the scalar one at the unit radius, over all space and time. So if we're talking about inverting a big distribution, you need a distribution which exactly is its inverse. So it has to have both the properties of that scalar divider that I showed you, the Nilpotent divider, and it has to have the distribution which is essentially circular, which is pretty lucky because all particles are pretty much essentially circular. Those spherical harmonics are a wonderful thing. They add together to exactly spherical systems all the way up. And funnily enough, that's exactly what nature does for some reason. Right, okay, now we come to the talk and I have three minutes left. <laughs> but that's all I need. So the conjecture is, what if this pivot can exist independently of being inside a material particle? What if we could get this somewhere, created by perhaps the processes that Mark was talking about? We could get that stuff existing somewhere far from particles. Now it can't form a particle. It doesn't have the dynamics of being confined. What would its properties be? Well, its properties would be, first of all, it's a mass density, very low mass density. We're talking about of the order of one proton per cubic meter of mass. 10 to the minus 27 kilograms per cubic meter is roughly the density of dark matter, dark energy, that kind of order. The stuff will be completely transparent to light. 
Light has no component in the pivot of the, the quedge hook. Light just travels through it, wouldn't see it at all. An essential feature of dark matter, I'd like to point out. It's not really dark, it's really transparent. Nothing to do with dark. Globally, it would interact gravitationally, but locally, it would constitute an energy density which goes as the square of its density. It looks like something which is pushing outwards. It has exactly the properties required of dark energy in that respect, with the right magnitude as well. Isolated elementary particles would have quite a lot of difficulty in absorbing it, partly because elementary particles are really quite small, and this stuff is really pretty thin, so it wouldn't see much of it, even if it... And also, they're tending to move with it, because an elementary, an isolated elementary particle is in free fall, and so is the dark matter. Not only that, it's difficult to conserve energy and momentum in the same way that isolated elementary particles can't emit and absorb light. However, any matter would just <laughs> grab it and turn it into a part of its own self. So the thing interacts very strongly with matter, not at all with light, and only a little bit with particles. Would, in terms of the theory. So it has a very strong interaction with matter. I mean, as in the strong interaction interaction with matter. So dark matter can hide if it's either weak or very strongly interacting in the presence of matter. Now, if this was the case, it would solve some other mysteries. One of them is solar, cor solar coronal heating. Outside the sun, you have a vacuum. You have fields. You presumably also have field cancellations. What I said about addition, that cannot go to zero. I would suggest that goes to pivot, to the thing which everything flows through. And if it does, you've got some energy density sitting there. If a particle comes along, or a plasma comes along, it's going to heat it. And the solar coronal temperatures are way above the surface sun temperatures. They're 100,000 degrees compared to 6,000. Something's heating it. What's heating it? People go, oh, magnetic fields. But magnetic fields don't heat things. Like, what? They make them go round and round in circles. It's bullshit. It's more bullshit. People really don't know what's causing this heating. I think it's pivot. Now. Also, it would solve this one. Um, diffuse starlight associated with dark matter. I'll show you that. Well, uh, there's the deep field. Isn't that pretty? Right. However, if you, and the deep field is uh, big, big Zs, the red shifts way up 5, 10, you already see galaxies. Now, imagine you had a collection of, these are galaxies, these represent galaxies, this is a simulation. If you had some shape noise that just came from some crap in space, so some sort of nasty lens, you get something like that. But if you had a, a dark matter in between you and those faraway galaxies, you'd see lensing, and the lensing would look like that. And if you have both, then it looks pretty similar. So what you actually observe is a 2018 paper. You observe this. Here's a region of dark matter. You can tell there's a region of dark matter there because you see the lensing. Look at it. So there's some dark matter there. But what these guys are arguing is that dark matter is associated with some light emission. And they say it must be due to some sort of diffuse starlight. That You always observe diffuse starlight between galaxies, right? Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. There are no stars, but there are very few stars out there. But there is this light coming off it. And I think where that light's coming, off it, coming from is exactly the pivot plasma interaction that you have in that. In that open area of space, and that this should be investigated experimentally. But this is the kind of thing that's being looked at at the moment, gravitational lensing. Here's another one, and uh, you see some of this same, same sort of thing. It's a bigger cluster of galaxies with some sort of dark matter region and a sort of banana shape in there. So the physical properties, what would the physical properties be? Physical properties would be it has mass, I've already talked about this, but there's an outward kind of pressure as well, there's some tension in space. It's like a sort of cosmic jello, jelly that you've got, which is pushing at the boundaries because obviously it's a, as a pressure, it only acts at the edges of things where it changes density. Uh, and, the, and the numbers are very small as well. The, the, the force of the, the heating of Earth traveling through, of the Earth traveling through uh, a region of dark matter at normal uh, universal densities would be about 10 to the minus 6 Kelvin surface. So you wouldn't really notice it unless there's a lot of it about. Uh, but nonetheless, and again the numbers are very small, but they're big if you take very big distances. Okay. So, coming near to the end of the talk now, three minutes later.
I have to apologise. Um, experimental tests, well, local solar coronal heating is one of them. Um, you might expect to see some anomalous heating on spacecraft travelling through empty regions of space. You might see a little bit of warming. Hard to detect because 10 to the minus 6 Kelvin warming is not exactly something that you really, you want to be cold to begin with, but faraway spacecraft might do that. Cosmological, does it fit the observed effect? Does it fit the kind of dark matter and dark energy that we actually observe in the cosmology? First of all, that's, can it be responsible for this to view starlight? I don't know, that's something I need to talk to the experts about. Um, it could be, if you have a clump of this stuff and matter hit it, it'd go boom, like an energy physics experiment. Could produce gamma rays, high energy particles, all sorts of stuff. And there are these things out there, and it's a mystery where they come from. Maybe it's a clump of dark matter, dark matter or dark energy. But I think that you can isolate this stuff in the laboratory. But perhaps not in the laboratory here in Liverpool. If you want a laboratory up there. You want to, you've got to get a damn good vacuum. This laboratory would just swallow it very rapidly. There's air, there's tables, people. <laughs> all, all of them would eat it. You need to be in a very, very, very high vacuum. And you need to be far from things. I'm not sure what the overlap function would be of these things, but if it can see a wave function, if matter wave functions are actually quite extended if you have a, a nice active particle, and uh, you know, it pretty much swallow things from at least 10 to the minus 10 meters. So, uh, you, But I think the way to do it would be to do field cancellation, something like that. Try and do something that violates conservation of energy by cancelling opposite electromagnetic fields, for example. You should be able to produce this stuff in the lab and then study it, or in a space lab. So that's the conclusions. So within a new theory, which is designed to, do, to explain how matter works, how, what elementary particles are and the dynamics of elementary particles, there is an element which could account for dark matter and dark energy. Yeah. Scalar field is not based on looking at cosmology and then doing the phenomenology. It's based on doing the phenomenology of elementary particles and then extending, extrapolating from them. So it comes from somewhere from much more fundamental. Free pivot has lots of the properties required of dark energy. I think these properties fit the observations far better than anything talking about a few starlight and from what I've seen of the papers that I've just been reading on, on this gravitational lensing. But that would need to be modeled and uh, investigated whether or not that was the case. So, and, and I've, I, I can make dozens of experiments that we need to do. It's hard stuff to isolate, but it should be doable. And that's the end of the talk. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> So, is there any prospect of any of the uh, experiments that you referred to um, before being performed? There's a chap, and you can't make this stuff up. Uh, he, he's a, he is, a, he is a, a, an executing uh, um, engineer for NASA. His name is Michael Mercury. <laughs> oh. Super girl. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, so Michael came on and listened to a talk of mine in San Diego in 2014. He then got in touch. Um, I had breakfast with him because he was flying out to Norway to spend two months in a retreat in Norway, which he's just got out of. He's back in California now. Um, he sat down and I nearly swallowed my beer. We were sitting there having a beer. And uh, he said, yeah, what I really want to do, guys, he's talking to me in my egg. What I really want to do is I want to find some means of funding you guys. This stuff is so exciting. We need to do these kind of experiments. And, and, uh, and he said, I think we need about, I think I'll go for 200 billion. He said, <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> so is there any prospect? I don't know. He's a crazy guy. Um, on, on the other hand, there's another chap um, also in, in California, a chap called Arnie Ben. He's been very hot on this stuff for some time. He's saying, well, I've got these friends, these corporations. Uh, yeah, there's one, one, one of the big sects of, uh, of Warner Brothers is interested. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> okay. And there's, 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 there's our friend, Darren. Um, the, way, the way I started working with Ennis here on this stuff is, I was in Glasgow, you need Darren as a filmmaker. So he comes in and uh, meets me. He's going down in the lift. I'm going up in the lift. He comes out of the lift and he sort of gives me a hug and says, Hey, hello, hi, John. I've, I've always wanted to make a movie about you. <laughs> so we've got footage. We started making movies. We've got a producer and a director. So is there any prospect? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't know. What do you reckon? 
<laughs> so, so, so there is an institute. It's called the Quicycle Institute. It's set up as a company, a, a charitable company, not for profit, confined so that my kids can't get any of the money even if they want it. Um, in such a way that the money's to set up an institute, which is what the Perimeter Institute should always have been and never was, to fund people from third world countries especially, but also bring people in from the rest of the world who are just smart for no good reason, and charge big corporations an enormous amount of money even to come and listen to what we're talking about. So that's the business model, if anyone wants to get involved. Oh, yeah, and if you come in for something real, like with physics, so for example, Peter, you're free. <laughs> so, so, so it will either fund people, if they are smart and, uh, and, uh, and excited and exciting, or it will be for nothing for real scientists, or it will cost a lot of money for people who think they want to know what's going on. We won't let them in otherwise. We won't release anything on YouTube. They have to come and watch and leave the phones outside. So anyway, but uh, yeah, maybe, I don't know. It all predicate, this is not a perturbative theory. It is absolutely calculable. So it is utterly subject to the scientific method. It just takes one experiment to say this is not true and it's dead. So maybe it's just all been a waste of time, eh? <laughs> about science. <laughs> okay, <laughs> more questions. I, I, I like the fact that you include energy in that, that makes a lot of sense. I think energy is one of the driving, the Hamiltonian stuff is always about energy and about making sure that energy is conserved. But everything is also nothing, just a rearrangement, it has to be. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah? Um, so I'm a philosopher. Physicist, but I did a project on William Ron Hamilton, but for his paper, Algebra is Pure Time. Is yeah, I know it well. And if that's like in any way related. Oh, it's very, very much related. He's the inspiration for all of us. So, and this is a development. The Quaternion Algebra, the algebra I presented has a subalgebra, which is the Quaternion Algebra, which is exactly Peter's algebra. It has another dual algebra, which isn't a Quaternion Algebra, because it's not closed, but nonetheless pretty much represents the other half of what Peter's been putting in his stuff. The quaternion algebras are absolutely central to this. So the subalgebras of this algebra are complex numbers, quaternions, um, and real number, obviously. So um, they're very closely related. And when Peter and I talk about this, we just, we've gone on different paths here, but the basis of what we're talking about is very similar, and it's not in conflict, up to a very high level. I mean, there are places where it isn't. There's room for discussion, but that's just fun. Would you feel that that algebra is pure time is like a philosophical precursor to the math work he did? That is the original thinking behind the development that led to Maxwell's equations amongst other things. Maxwell took this on board. He did. What mathematics is, is it's a language which allows you to think other things you otherwise couldn't think about at all. And what Hamilton did when he brought his mathematics out is he opened up a huge area of thinking. Which which Maxwell used to develop his theory. He then later translated it to the much simpler stuff we use today, which is, which is, um, which is um, Heaviside's vector algebra, which is the stuff that everybody, we've all been taught in university. We haven't really been, who was taught quaternions properly at uni? Not at all. Yeah, see, the actual, the, no, we hear about them, you know, talking in, talking in the bar or over lunch or something. But to actually get taught this, Maxwell's textbook has sort of, every, every, every section has, some, has something like 10 pages in Heaviside notation, and then half a page doing the same thing in Quaternions. Every time, much more beautiful, much faster, much better brain tool. Mathematics lets you think things, you're, this is why this stuff is so potent. You get the underlying algebra right, and the only stuff that comes out is stuff that's allowed and stuff that actually happens. It's potent. The work going into, you guys, that's 30 years of work just, and we still haven't even finished the maths. You know, that mathematics. Ago, but, uh, before there were any, there are now textbooks about I know there are. Some, I know there are. But like when I was a graduate student or an undergraduate, there was Wheeler's book on, uh, on gravitation. Yeah. And there, were very, there was a very good chapter about quaternions and the bell trick and so on in yeah. there in a physics book, but you wouldn't find it in a math book. Mm -hmm. No. Not in an advanced calculus book. 
Mm. That's true. That the yeah, that's right. Months work. Wars of the 1800s. That's right. That's right. That's right. And they have to have some. The double covering of Bretonians is thought to be a problem. It's a solution. It's, it's, it's how it should be. Absolutely, totally. I mean, when I first came here 30 odd years ago, um, this one of the staff, we shall be nameless, said to me, what are you working on? And I said, I'm using quaternions. Oh, nobody bothers with quaternions now. And that was it, end of conversation. <laughs> <laughs> by, by the way, yeah. um, Last year, I helped him to publish a paper. Ah, using quaternions. <laughs> yes. He wasn't, he wasn't using quaternions, right? Now. So, so he had to tell somebody who actually was competent. Because he couldn't find anywhere to publish it, and I said we would. So, very, so, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm organising a conference next year. So we'll decide when we're having this one, won't we? So we'll try and fit it in with this. Fit in with other ones. Yeah. Yes, with, with, with Vigier as well. Vigier's end of August. Yeah. There'll be this one. Any others you want to fit it with? Uh, possibly. I'll talk to you about it. Go ahead. But where do you want to hold it? Uh, I've got an island. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Cumbria. Yeah, Cumbria, yeah. 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 Yeah, surrounded by crystal clear. We're snorkeling in this stuff is amazing. You can see for 20, 30 metres through. It's gorgeous. It, the smell is amazing. It, there's almost no traffic. It's only got one road. Left, <laughs> you can go around it left door, right. <laughs> or a boat. <laughs> or a boat, yeah. yeah. That's great. Can I just say that there's plenty more places open than there were yesterday? You know, now we're going to go for lunch, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs>